turn it over to Dylan Gomes. So can everyone see my screen? This one? Wow. Well, um, <clears throat> thanks, Jesse. That was, <laughs> that was a very sweet introduction, and I really appreciate it. Um, and thanks, everyone, for coming. There uh, is quite a big turnout here. Um, and for sake of time, we'll just get started. So as the world becomes more urbanized, sensory pollutants such as artificial light and noise come with it. For the past two decades, a large body of research has accumulated on the effects of human-made or anthropogenic noise on wildlife. And the negative effects of noise on wildlife have been documented across various taxa from invertebrates like insects and cuttlefish to vertebrates like fish, frogs, mammals, and birds. There has been considerable taxonomic bias in which critters we study as birds and mammals have received by far the most attention. Um, in a sense, you might say that singing birds have become a bit of a model system for studying the effects of anthropogenic noise. And perhaps it isn't surprising that researchers have documented so many negative effects across the animal kingdom, considering many rely heavily on sound for so many purposes, such as finding food, avoiding predators, and communicating. Much of the anthropogenic noise research to date has focused on acoustic communication, which is perhaps the most obvious way that noise may make one's life difficult. And many organisms respond to noise in a way that appears to be attempts to mitigate the effects of noise. So bow-winged grasshoppers near roadways call at higher frequencies than their forest counterparts. Two-striped grass frogs call more often near airplane and motorcycle noise, while orcas produce longer duration calls in the presence of boat noise. Unsurprisingly, since we are animals too, we also have solutions. So we tend to focus more on, on lip movements and body gestures when communicating in noisy spaces. And we tend to forget about noise as something that is a pollutant, as many people are born into and then spend their busy lives in urban centers. But noise appears to be part of the reason why many of us animals avoid loud, busy areas and seek refuge in quiet, natural spaces. But not all natural places are quiet. So this Whitewater River, only an hour north of Boise, can produce an intense roar for all or most of the year. And there are over five and a half million kilometers of rivers and streams in the US alone. So the sounds of moving water are an incredibly pervasive natural source of noise that has the potential to be an important ecological niche axis. And unsurprisingly, animals have very similar responses to many abiotic and biotic sources of natural noise that likely aid in communication. So willets that live near crashing surf noise sing at higher frequencies than those living inland. King penguins in wind noise and Cope's gray tree frog in frog chorus noise both increase call duration and call more often. So many of the strategies to deal with noise do not appear to be novel strategies that have arisen due to anthropogenic noise. And when we think about the evolutionary history of hearing, anthropogenic noise does not come on the scene until very late. So here this black timeline is blown up at the very end for emphasis. And the heuristic is highlighting that animals have been dealing with naturally loud sources of noise since they've evolved hearing organs, while human-made noise is relatively new. So these animals that have evolved in a naturally noisy world likely have evolved coping mechanisms to deal with noise and have then co-opted these responses to novel anthropogenic noise. So perhaps if we can learn a bit about this evolutionary relationship with natural noise, we can better understand how animals might respond to today's human-influenced acoustic environments. So we have a bit of a hypothesis here that animals are evolved to deal with natural sources of noise. And ultimately, we want to be able to understand how they might be able to deal with, or not, anthropogenic noise sources. So how do we bridge the gap between these two seemingly different things? Well, we'll start by thinking about different acoustic environments, like the one around this dam. So is this acoustic environment dominated by natural noise or anthropogenic? Well, the source of the noise is falling water, which we might think of as natural, 
yet humans appeared to have put it there in that geographic location. Well, what if human-induced climate change alter rain and snowfall in a way that temporally changes periods of high and low stream flow, as is predicted by climate science? Well, hopefully we can see from these two examples that natural and anthropogenic are really just constructs, and humans have the capacity to affect the acoustic environment on large spatial and temporal scales. So what can we do? Well, noise or sound in general has three major components. That is frequency or the number of pressure wave oscillations in one second. So we perceive this as pitch. Amplitude or the intensity of that pressure wave, which is perceived as loudness. And the temporal patterning of those two components. So instead of classifying sounds into categories, we can instead quantify sounds or noise and incorporate these measures in our understanding of noise impacts on wildlife. So let's look at a couple of examples of what this looks like. So here at the top, uh, or here we have a spectrogram of a river and, and at the top, there are three wiggly uh, blue lines, which is kind of indicating that that's a river. And so spectrograms have frequency on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And for reference, the horizontal dotted lines across the plot show the boundaries between ultrasound at the top, sound that we humans can hear in the middle and then infrasound on the very bottom. And then the color in the spectrogram is a measure of relative amplitude from high amplitude in red to low amplitudes in dark blue, which then fades to black as no sound is picked up from a microphone. So we can see that river noise has at least some energy from infrasound to ultrasound. And to get a big, bit of a feel for what this um, river might look like, this photo is taken very close to where this recording was made. And now a power spectrum, on the other hand, captures the frequency components, which are still on the y-axis in this case, and the amplitude components, which are now on the x. So no time information is embedded within these plots, but it shows the amplitude profile a bit better. Often these plots are rotated 90 degrees, which we'll see in a bit, but we did this here to align these frequency axes. So now we can compare this to a recording of a road and you can see that there's a bit more color in the higher frequencies or so more ultrasound in the river recording and that the road noise is a bit more temporally modulated or less consistent, which is indicated by these spiky looking bits across the top of the spectrogram. So why might this all matter? Well, one of the major mechanisms underlying noise effects is called masking. So here we have two power spectra plotted together. The axes are flipped here relative to before. So frequency is on the X axis and sound pressure or amplitude is on the Y. So if we focus on the gray polygon in the background, this is our hypothetical noise. And we can see that there's more energy or a higher sound level in the lower frequencies. So on the left of that plot than in the higher frequencies. This is pretty typical of noise. The signal of interest here, which is in blue, could be a communication signal um, like birdsong, or it could be the sounds of a prey or a predator. So notice that most of this blue signal is embedded within or covered by the gray noise. This is central to the idea of masking. The red vertical line is called the critical ratio, which is a measure of the detectability of a tone and noise. So it's calculated as the difference in sound level of the just detectable tone and the spectrum level background noise. So what that means in layperson's terms is that this blue signal needs to be outside the gray noise by the distance of that red bar for a signal to be detected or heard. And earlier I mentioned that animals change communication signals in different ways in response to both anthropogenic and natural noise. The reason that some of these changes likely help communication can be viewed through the same lens. So in the far left column, the signal is now in a less noisy environment. So notice that the gray noise has decreased in sound level and the red critical ratio bar is now outside of the noise so the signal is heard as we move from the top to the bottom. So in the middle column, the noise doesn't change but the blue signal gets louder and then in the far right column, the blue signal is shifted, shifted upwards in frequency enough for that signal to be heard. While it might seem like we're getting a bit into the weeds here, this is important if we were to understand how noise affects wildlife. We wanna know what components of the noise itself is actually driving the patterns that we see. 
So in experimental biology, we can use this idea to explicitly test the effects of masking by broadcasting noise, indicated here by these shaded gray blocks, that either overlap with the signal or do not overlap with that signal. And taking the same idea to the community level, we might expect something like this. So this is a schematic spectrogram where we're ignoring time and instead we're sorting silhouettes of animals based on their vocalization frequency. So animals that vocalize higher frequencies are at the top and lower frequencies at the bottom. The dark gray or black bars are representing noise that is either low frequency on the left or somewhat higher frequency on the right. And we would expect that noise that overlaps with vocalization frequencies to filter these animals out. So in other words, the animals might avoid these areas because their signals are masked. And so higher frequencies would essentially slice that community in a different place, again, depending on the vocalization frequency. So we took this idea, and instead of testing each animal one at a time in the lab, we did this across a landscape. So the schematic noise on the left here represents our whitewater river noise, and the one on the right represents river noise that is shifted upwards in frequency. And just to belabor the point of the experiment a bit, so here are three spectrograms from different recordings at different stream sites at control field sites of ours. And you can see that the one on the left has very little energy, and the one on the right is much more intense. So we can use this gradient to understand how noise might shape wildlife abundance, distributions, or behavior. But epistemologically, we are measuring correlations, and we would have trouble pointing any causational fingers. So these photos aren't from our sites, but they highlight that different size streams can have a lot of confounding variables, like slope or stream humidity, for example. Now, these two spectrograms in the top right are from the same location, but with experimental river speakers turned off on the left or on in the right. So this experiment allows us to turn a stream that looks and feels like the one on the left into one that sounds like one on the right without all the confounds of a whitewater stream. And again, the experimental approach also lets us shift noise upwards in frequency to try to understand the mechanisms behind the patterns that we might see. So this bottom pair of spectrograms is from a shifted river site with speakers either off or on. In the Pioneer Mountains, where this work took place, it's just east of Boise, about two and a half hours, we studied 20 sites. 10 of those sites were control sites. So these are indicated here as circles. So there was no experimental manipulation, but they had a gradient of sound levels and background frequencies because they had different size and sloped streams. The sound levels here are shown as white to a red gradient um, in the bottom right. And so a white circle represents a relatively quiet site around 40 decibels. So this is typical, a typical level for many homes um, unless you have kids or barking dogs or something. And a dark red site represents intense sites. So the high 70s um, is similar to a vacuum cleaner in a confined space or heavy traffic noise outside. The 10 other sites are experimental. And so squares represent Whitewater River playback sites, which were the lower frequency spectrograms from before. And the triangles represent river treatments that are shifted upwards in frequency. So at these, all of these experimental sites, there are already streams, but they're relatively quiet. And so what we did is we turned those acoustic environments into one mimicking whitewater rapids or shifted rapids while holding uh, as many habitat variables constant as we could. So to do this, we loaded um, a couple of U-Haul trailers and pickup trucks full of acoustics gear and hauled it to the Pioneers. So here's a photo of a couple of trucks that are, uh, leaf springs are pretty loaded down on. Um, here's a picture of some solar controllers, just different electronics for the solar panels, uh, boxes, random gear. We took up the hallway in the Raptor Research Center with, uh, you can see some solar panels on the left, um, some fuzzy windscreens and, and different pieces of conduit. And uh, here, here are some of our batteries, not all of them. And so how much gear exactly that we carried is hard to know, but rough calculations indicate that it was almost four tons, which is quite a lot. And we hiked this gear on our backs into and out of our sites each year. 
And so here's just a couple of photos of that. Uh, usually a lot of willows and different vegetation that likes to get in the way. Um, but there was an exception. So one year we had a road that was taken out by a pretty intense snow melt. And then the county came and barricaded it. So at some of our sites um, during the first year, we used a team of pack mules to get our gear out there. So here you can see a previous postdoc of ours and I tying some solar panels up to one of the mules. Um, and so here's how most of the landscape looks at our sites. It's dominated by sagebrush, but has these riparian areas full of cottonwoods, aspen, and willows. So why did we need all this gear? Well, we wanted to produce noise on the landscape that would be biologically relevant or meaningful. And so that meant high intensity. And for that, you need pretty loud, uh, pretty large speakers because some of them weigh about 60 pounds and you need that to be able to produce very loud um, signals or noise. And that also means uh, continuous noise. So while there are some daily and seasonal fluctuations in stream flow, rivers generally don't turn off during particular periods of the day. So we needed solar panels and banks of batteries to keep each speaker powered through each night. And so this allowed us to play noise 24 seven for the duration of each summer. And the other thing that was really important to us was to present this habitat as noisy before our study animals got there. So once birds are established, they might be reluctant to give up a subpar site. So by starting noise playback early in the year, so you can see this in this picture, it's snowing um, in early May, we hope to get a clearer picture of habitat selection decisions pre-establishment of territories. So each site um, looked something like this. So we had an array of speakers suspended by metal conduit tripods along a stream. We then observed three locations nested within each site with three minute point count surveys. These locations were different distances from the speakers to create a gradient of sound levels and frequencies within each site. So the middle location at a site would tend to be a lot louder than the sites on the extremities or the locations rather on the extremities. We also placed ultrasonic bat detectors in each of these locations as well to monitor bat activity. And here's a photo of uh, what this might look like. So you can see the recording unit hanging in the middle of this tripod and a couple of microphones at the top. Because we created a gradient of noise within each site and because there's a lot of natural variation in the background acoustic environment, we didn't really create noise treatments per se but instead what um, I like to call realized treatments. So here you can see density plots of the sound levels that sites naturally had, so the, the left panel, and the right panel shows sound levels when the speakers were turned on at river, which is the river sites, which are in yellow, and uh, shifted river in blue. So we needed a way to quantify these acoustic environments at these different sampling locations. So we also placed small reporters at each of the 60 locations. So remember there are 20 sites and there are three locations per site. And the recorders went in these big fuzzy windscreens that we like to call Russian hats. And the photo on the left is one on its own with a Pelican box and a battery um, inside that box. And so on, then on the right, you can see that that uh, Russian hat is attached to a, a bat detector. So these devices recorded for 24 hours a day for two to three weeks at a time. And then we had to go hike back out there and swap batteries out um, because they would die. And then combined across all 60 locations during the first two years, we collected and analyzed over 106,000 hours of acoustic recordings, um, which certainly took some computation time. And in the end, we distilled all that information down into two daily values that were attributed to each location. So there was a measure of sound pressure level and a measure of frequency. Okay, so we're starting to get into some results now. We observed 73 species of birds, all of which are pictured here, in over 7,000 observations from nearly 2,000 visits um, to the various locations. All right, so on the y-axis here, we have birds at sampling locations for each count day. So a value of 10 suggests we saw 10 birds at that location on that day, but it doesn't tell you if that were 
there was 10 different species or 10 individuals of one species. They're all aggregated here for visualization purposes. And on the x-axis, we have sound pressure level. So now the line going through these data are not, is not a trend line, but rather a model prediction line through the data. So we fit negative binomial um, generalized linear mixed effects models with 10 fixed effects, you know, 10 covariates, and site level random effects. So while holding all other fixed effects at their median values, we ask what the model predicts for the number of birds across that range of sound levels. So the shaded area is a 95% confidence interval. And if this was a, trend, was a trend line, you might expect the error around that line to kind of be broader to sort of encapsulate the data. But again, these are just the effects of sound level at that very specific um, value for all the other terms, right? So we, if we were to change those other terms to not be the median, that line might go through different points on the graph. And it's just one realization of visualizing this relationship. So hopefully that makes sense because we're going to see a few plots um, like that. A lot of people will plot the model estimate and the, the error around that separately. And I just wanted to visualize it with the data. So birds are less abundant, generally the louder an area gets. And specifically bird abundance here is dropping by 7% every 12 decibels. And here's a similar plot, um, except on the y-axis, we don't show the points aggregated, but instead we're letting each point represent an individual species. So this allows us to look at what we are calling spectral overlap. So here the x-axis is the difference between background frequency, so that we measured at a location, and the specific vocalization frequency of that species. Right, so a value of zero here, on the, which is on the right of this flipped axis, indicates perfect overlap. So you can't go beyond zero because this measure is essentially the distance from your song as a species being overlapped by the background noise. So the plot here in B does seem to suggest that masking is at least somewhat driving bird abundance, avoidance um, because there are fewer birds as the noise overlaps their song and birds decline about 10% every two kilohertz of spectral overlap. However, when we look at interaction plots between sound level and frequency, the story is more complicated. So similar to the last plot, each one of these insets is the predicted number of birds by the spectral overlap, or we call it frequency difference here, but it's the same thing. At the top of the bottom left panel, you can see that it says 30 dB or 30 decibels. So this shows that during low sound levels, the frequency overlap does seem to mask bird vocalizations like we saw in the previous plot. But as you move towards higher sound levels, and once you get to pretty loud environments, 70 dB, that effect starts to go away and spectral overlap no longer seems to affect birds. So this suggests that masking of vocalization is no longer the primary mechanism underlying the changes we see in abundance but instead might be disrupting foraging or auditory surveillance of predators or something like that, but that's just speculative. So to try to better understand what's going on, we glued over 700 clay caterpillars to riparian vegetation and scored them for bird predation. So at the top of this clay caterpillar, you can see there's an indent left from a, a bird's bill. Um, and the results from that are here. So on the y-axis is the probability of a bird attack on a caterpillar, and on the x-axis is the sound level again. So the raw data points here are collapsed by site. A value of 0.4 means that four of 10 caterpillars were depredated by birds at that location. And while controlling for local bird abundance, we see a substantial decrease in attacked caterpillars as sound levels increase. So this is pretty interesting because these clay caterpillars didn't make any sound. So the task was entirely visual. That means that a mechanism such as masking can't be at play here, but instead it's possibly evidence of distraction, um, which is defined as a, a limited attentional resource being allocated to a sensory disturbance such as noise. And these wouldn't be the first effects of noise affecting a visual task, uh, first evidence rather. And so for bats, there were 12 species detected um, in 100,000 identified bat passes from about 2,200 site nights. 
And we see a similar relationship between activity and sound levels as we do for birds. So as it gets louder, there are relatively fewer bats. Bat activity decreases about 8% every 12 dB. So if you remember, it was about 7% for birds uh, along a similar gradient. And as the frequency of noise gets louder, we also see fewer bats. So while bat echolocation calls are high frequency, this pattern isn't likely due to masking because echolocation signals are so much higher frequency than the noise here. So if you remember that, that blue and gray kind of critical ratio plot, that the blue signal is so far outside of that gray noise that it's, it's really unlikely. But these bats do hear better at higher frequencies. And so higher frequency noise might be perceived as louder as well, which could contribute to this pattern. But as I alluded to in the beginning, sound perception is used for many things other than communication, such as finding prey. So here, all of these animals are foraging by listening for sounds that are produced by the prey themselves. And in fact, a few species of bats at our study sites are able to flexibly switch between hunting with echolocation, which is a self-produced and very high frequency um, sound, so at the top here, and hunting by what is called passive listening at the bottom. So this is listening for much lower frequency sounds that are produced by the prey, either communication calls or, or the sounds of footsteps. And what is really convenient experimentally about this is that relatively lower frequency river noise, here uh, at shown as this red band, can mask low frequency prey generated sounds, but won't mask echolocation pulses. So we created foraging tests for each of these two behaviors. The first were fake insect wings that you can see here in this inset attached to a motor that's mimicking a fluttering insect wing. So the idea here is to create an echoacoustic target that can attract bats foraging via echolocation. We then have a microphone set up nearby on the left here to record which bats come to our robot insect wings. The second set of foraging tests is a speaker. So it's that black box in the middle there that is playing uh, an assortment of prey generated sounds. So these were cricket mating sounds and insect walking sounds. And passive listening bats forage by honing in on these sounds, but they still use echolocation for general surveillance of the landscape and navigation. So we used the same microphones and recording units to capture who was vis visiting these foraging tests. So there's a lot going on here. This is a bit complicated. Um, on the y-axis is the aggregated number of bat passes per site per night. And the x-axis is sound pressure levels, which is kind of the same as we saw before. And then the blue dots here are raw data from prey speaker foraging tests, while the red dots are from the robotic insect tests. So just like before, the model line, the lines are model prediction lines but you'll notice that there are two lines for each color. So this is to show um, the interaction effects all in one plot between sound level and frequency. So the upper two lines of each color are representing higher frequencies and the lower two lines are rep representing relatively lower frequencies. So if we start on the left, the top blue line shows that at higher frequencies, the relationship between bat foraging activity and sound levels is strongly negative and this relationship is weaker at lower frequencies, which is the line below. So what this suggests is the relatively higher frequencies are likely more important for bats to be able to hear and thus locate our prey sound speakers. And if you remember earlier, I said that bats hear it better, uh, better at higher frequencies. So this might just indicate that the higher frequencies are masking the prey sounds more than the relatively low frequencies. So now if we look at the foraging activity during echolocation tasks, we see that there is higher bat activity as sound pressure level increases. And this relationship is stronger when the frequencies get higher. So there isn't an obvious reason why echolocation activity should increase in these types of noise, but this may at least partially be explained by strategy switching. That is, this plot contains only data from bats that are known to be flexible in the type of foraging that they do. So it's possible that bats are unable to find prey sounds and noise and are switching to active echolocation. 
And while these data suggest that this may be the case, this is speculative, and we really need to follow up with individual tracking systems or lab work to make this claim more strongly. Okay, so we've discussed the effects of river noise on bats and birds, but of course, these two groups are intimately linked through their prey. So we are also hoping to understand how insects were affected by noise so that we can start filling in a more holistic picture of what is going on. To do this, we sampled insects via six trapping techniques. So on the top left, we have a yellow vein trap, then a blue vein trap, which both attract flower visitors. Then an ultraviolet light bucket trap, which tends to attract nocturnal insects. Um, and then on the right, we have a cartoon of a pitfall trap, which samples terrestrial arthropods that are just sort of walking along and then fall right in. Um, on the bottom left, we have a malaise trap that passively samples insects moving through an area, which tends to be more flying insects. And then lastly, we have beet netting. So this is where you go to a bush um, and you, you, uh, we happen to beet net willows at our sites. And then you scientifically kind of hit the bush with a stick or a rod and collect the arthropods that fall out of that bush. And I will note here that none of these photos are from our sites or are even mine. And so this is a warning to all the other grad students watching to take photos of your experimental setup and sites before it is far too late. So returning to our cartoon diagram of the typical site, I've now added a silhouette of an earwig to show that we also sampled insects at all three locations per site. However, once we started identifying these things, we soon realized that we collected an insane number of specimens. So we only identified the samples from the middles of our sites, which was still over 150,000 individual specimens that we identified to the order level. And so for insects that use sound for communication, such as mate attraction or sound for predator avoidance, we might expect these insects to be less abundant in noisy areas because simply because they can't hear well. So there might be direct negative effects of sound on these um, insects. Yet if noise negatively affects their predators, birds and bats, we might expect noise to have an indirect positive effect on insect abundance. So what did we see? So we built Bayesian generalized linear mixed effects models for each order and trap type combination. So here I've just plotted each model estimate um, with credible intervals around that for sound pressure level. So each each vertical bar here is from a different model, but plotting them this way allows us to compare these estimates across taxa. And color here is indicating a, a change in order. So you can see that there were, so I, I should just explain that the central dot is the, the median draw and the, the thick bars are 80% credible intervals and the, the thin lines are 90% credible intervals. And you can see that quite a few groups uh, were either positively or negatively affected by sound level. So it did seem to be important. And many of the patterns are positive, which again, we might expect to be indirect effects. So bird and bat predators did move out of the area and that might reflect why we're seeing this increase. The frequency patterns though, um, tell a little bit different story. So that is most of the groups responded negatively to higher frequencies. And this is the same direction that vertebrate predators tended to respond in. So if indirect effects are driving abundance patterns, we would expect the results to, to be in opposite directions. So it seemed that at least in this plot, um, that wouldn't be a viable explanation for these patterns. It gets a little more complicated and I think more interesting if we look at the interaction effects. So here on the y-axis are the predicted number of Plecoptera, which you might know as stone flies, and then sound levels again on the X. The effect of sound levels here are dependent on the effect of frequency. So as frequency decreases, the slope changes from negative to positive. In other words, as the acoustic environment gets more intense, there are more stone flies if the frequency is relatively low, but there are fewer stone flies if the frequency is high. And interestingly, we see the same pattern for trichopterans, which are known as caddisflies. 
And these two are the only two obligate aquatic insect groups. And while this is definitely speculation, this might suggest that these critters are using some combination of stream sound level and frequency to, to make habitat selection decisions. In choosing suitable stream sites, play an important role for these insects. And so finding those areas might be especially important in a dry desert environment such as the one we worked in. So using sound cues could certainly aid in this process, but again, we're not sure. So we've explored um, a few of these groups, but there is another that sits right in the center of this diagram, and those are orb-weaving spiders. So as intermediate predators, they're both predators of insects and they're prey to birds and bats. And our sites had two large species of orb-weaving spiders, so Tetragnatha versicolor and Lorinioides patagiatus. So I measured abundance from four meter transects along streams, and that was defined as the number of actively foraging spiders or spiders that were sitting on an orb web. And to better understand foraging, um, I also measured orb, orb web dimensions, which can be then used to calculate how much effort spiders are putting into foraging. So the web is essentially an extended phenotype. And um, then measured how many insects were captured in webs. So this isn't exactly prey capture because uh, orb moving spiders typically wrap up and consume prey immediately but it's instead some metric of insect availability or perhaps insect behavior. And lastly, I, I weighed and measured leg segments of spiders to calculate body condition, which is an indirect measure of fitness and likely influenced by web size and insect consumption. Okay. So orb weaving spiders responded strongly positively to sound levels. So this plot is gonna look a bit different from before uh, than the previous ones. And so number of spiders is on the Y, sound level again on the X. But instead of plotting um, something like a, a shaded credible interval around uh, these Bayesian generalized linear mixed effects models, here I've just plotted the, the model, uh, the, the um, innermost draws from, from the model. So yeah, just, just taking the, instead of a 95% credible shaded interval, I've plotted 95% of the innermost draws or excluded the five most extreme draws from the posterior of the model. So interestingly, both species responded in nearly identical ways to sound levels. And here are the estimates from the, the same model, but showing all the other fixed effects. So on the Y axis, we have a list of fixed effects and on the X axis are the standardized effect sizes. Since all of these data are scaled by two standard deviations, all of these effect sizes are directly comparable. The dots here in the middle are the median draw, thick bars are 80% credible intervals, and thin lines are 90% credible intervals. So any estimates to the right side of this uh, dotted line in the, in the middle or dashed line in the middle um, indicate that spiders were, were more abundant and anything to the left side, um, those are negative effects are indicating fewer spiders. So you can see from this plot that sound pressure has the strongest effect for both species out of all predictors. So it's surprisingly an even stronger predictor for things that are known to alter or weaver behavior like wind speed and temperature. Um, here's a similar plot as before, but this is now for the web catch area. So this is the area of the sticky part of the web. And you can see that Lorinioides webs um, in red are getting smaller as sound levels increase, but Tetragnatha webs don't appear to change much. And we, when we look at standardized effect sizes for catch area, sound pressure level is the strongest predictor for Lorinioides patagiatus webs, um, which is down at the bottom in red, meaning that these spiders are reducing web size substantially in loud places. And it is thought that spiders that build smaller webs are generally more satiated. That is, they don't need such a big web. There are examples, however, of malnourished spiders not being able to build big webs because they don't have the resources. So there's a little bit of a conundrum there, but um, it might help if we look at body condition. So here are 
higher body conditions to the right and lower body conditions to the left, same sort of plot as before. And you can see that most variables are not reliably altering body condition. For Lurinioides patagiatis, there is a positive trending effect of sound level. That's in red at the very bottom. And we estimate a 91% probability of a positive effect. This does seem to be in line with them building smaller webs if webs are energetically expensive to build. Um, Tetragnatha versus color body condition nor web size from the previous plot changed any. So despite the differences in both of these species in what we see for, for web building behavior and body condition, they both increase dramatically in abundance. So we're gonna explore this, uh, why this might be. So firstly, spiders might be directly affected by river noise. They might use it as a habitat cue or be attracted for some other reason. And orb weavers have never been found to hear airborne sound in the way that we do, but recent work suggests that spider webs can transduce airborne sound into substrate vibrations nearly perfectly. In fact, better than the best microphones ever produced. So it's possible that they're using their webs like giant ears and are able to assess the acoustic environment that way, but we're not sure. It's also possible that river noise is altering their prey or prey capture rates, which then affect spiders. So we're calling these bottom-up effects. And so spiders had all of these groups in their webs. Um, so diptera and ephemeroptera in the top, flies and mayflies. And most of the webs contained a lot of those two. And then we had very few insects of the bottom row. So moths, stoneflies, and plecopterans, uh, or trichopterans, uh, which are caddisflies. So the only, only the two groups at the top had enough data to model. And I'll just say that mayflies showed no change. And so we'll add no change there and data deficient across the bottom three, just to sort of build out this picture. And so if we back up to the insect plot from earlier to try to get a feel for what dipterans might be doing um, at the order level, we see that there is no change in abundance due to higher sound levels. So any changes that we might see in webs, um, in spider webs, are likely due to behavior or something like that. With the caveat that um, the order level is very taxonomically crude. So while I am trying to put all these pieces together to get a better understanding of what might be going on, we should be skeptical about relating these patterns in a causational way. And so back, back to these uh, spider web plots for dipterans, um, you can see that there's more dipterans captured uh, or any, any, sorry, any estimates to the right indicates more dipterans captured and then there are fewer on the left. And so sound pressure level at the bottom suggests positive effects for tetragnatha and negative for lurinioides. So lurinioides in red are catching fewer dipterans, but if you remember, they also had smaller webs. So What's likely going on here is dipterans are possibly too small to be energetically useful prey. And if you remember, I said these things are really abundant in webs, which is why we could run models in the first place, but you wouldn't really expect that if they were really viable prey. So instead you'd expect them to be consumed by the spiders. So perhaps these spiders are sati satiated by other prey which we've done a poor job at measuring here. And then due to the satiation, they're building smaller webs and this, thus catching fewer dipterans as bycatch. The patterns for tetragnatha are, are odd. So they seem to be catching more dipterans despite the same sized webs, which might be a behavioral thing um, with dipterans. So dipterans might be getting distracted or something like that and flying into tetragnatha webs more. And this is all speculative, but the, the way that these two spiders build webs is very different. So tetragnatha tend to build horizontal webs and lurinioides tend to build vertical webs. So um, this is all speculative, but just sort of pushing uh, or, or highlighting ways to push forward in future work. And so to remind ourselves what we're trying to do is we're just trying to understand bottom up effects. And so I've, I've highlighted the, the patterns here that we get from the web models, but the fact that these three things in the bottom were in webs, but not that abundant, suggests to me that possibly those are more important prey. And so we do have abundance data from those three orders, Lepidoptera, Plecoptera, and Trichoptera here, but there are no effects to sound level. So we would expect to see something if, if we were going to explain uh, why there are more spiders in higher sound levels, but 
um, doesn't seem to be to be there. So it looks like we have very limited, uh, or, or sorry, we, we rather have no evidence that bottom-up effects are driving the patterns that we're seeing here. So to return to the schematic, there, there are a couple more uh, explanations. And one is that spiders are eaten by birds and bats, which can be affected by uh, noise themselves. And if you remember from earlier, that is in fact what happened. So in, in fact, these very species of spiders have been found in the diets of uh, birds and bats. And they've been found in the exact, uh, some of the same species of birds and bats that we have at our study sites. So it's possible that the increases in orb weaver abundance we see is linked to having fewer predators, um, but future work can elucidate this a bit. And lastly, I just want to point out that it's likely more complicated than that. The birds and bats are also affecting the prey availability as well, which is going to require a little more complex analysis. So in future work, all these links will become more clear as we start to connect our data sets in different ways. And just to briefly highlight one of those is we've captured six of our uh, 200 birds of, of our six most common species at our sites. Um, we had them in hand, stuffed them in, in bag, uh, bags to allow them to defecate, and then we scraped this poop off uh, for DNA sequencing. And I was fortunate enough to spend a semester um, with Drs. Craig Bateman and Akito Kawahara at the University of Florida, extracting DNA, running PCR, and preparing these samples for sequencing with the goal of eventually building these bipartite networks so we can begin to understand who is eating whom in the system and start to make these connections a little more concrete to understand all of our data more holistically. Because in the end, all of these organisms are connected and being able to understand how these connections pull on each other in various environmental conditions will allow us to understand the stability of the food webs and how the connections within might shift under different environmental um, conditions. So with that, thank you all for listening. And I just have a couple of uh, thank you slides. So this is, um, we had a huge field team to do all this work and we had a lot of uh, hard times and a lot of type two fun, but it was a good group to work with. Um, I also wanna thank all of my students who worked with me to identify these, you know, over a hundred thousand bugs. And <clears throat> that was a really good experience. I want to thank uh, Dr. Kito Kawahara and his lab for taking me on for a semester and kind of uh, making me one of their own. That was that was a really good experience. And I have to thank Hunter Cole for just being an incredible worker, coding partner, roommate and friend. And there's literally no one I would rather have on a field crew than this guy. <clears throat> I have to thank my wonderful life partner, Laura Grace Barta, who supported me through this endeavor in so many ways, personally, and by helping out on a lot of the field work and interpretation of the patterns here. And lastly, I have to thank this guy. So Dr. Jesse Barber has been an incredible, incredible mentor and friend and advisor, and has just really, really always been there for me, both, both professionally and personally. And, um, I really appreciate him. Um, so just lastly, a list of all the people who's helped out. The landowners, Brian and Kathleen Bean, allowed us to do all this manipulation on their land. Um, my committee, Jen Forby, Ian Robertson, Clint Francis, and Akito Kawahara have all been very supportive. And um, thanks with that. Uh, we'll open it up for questions. Can you see their hands raised, Dylan? Uh, no. Where do I see that at? If you go to the uh, gallery view. So, who, uh, a few people yeah, have I, another down. You can raise your hand yeah. physically, too. You could just interrupt, you know, butt in and interrupt, too, because I, I don't see anybody with their hands up on my screen. Saw Eric Hayden with his video hand up. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll fire away. 
So, um, you know, a lot of like your graphs are really converting sound to vision, right? We can see the sound in sort of a very, um, in a very beautiful way, actually. And it kind of just pointed out that we are such a visually obsessed species, like our brain demands vision. And then when you started talking about the spider webs as, as ears, uh, it sort of like blew my mind a little bit. And I thought I'd ask you, how much of the world are we missing because of our vision obsessed brains? And how hard is it to sort of put yourself in the position of invertebrates that perceive the world just so much differently than us? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I, I think actually studying bats really highlights this well because they are emitting high frequency echolocation pulses, right? And they're getting reflections off of different objects that comes back. And the way we think about it is that they're seeing with sound, right? They're creating a visual image or they're whatever, but they just have such a different view of the world and, and even to visualize, um, you know, the spectrograms and things like instead of why aren't we just, you know, listening to the spec, listening to the sound and sort of analyzing them that way. Well, we just don't, we just don't seem to have the capacity to be able to do that. So I think it's a great point. And, you know, there are lots of all, all kinds of other sensory modalities that are really weird, like electro perception and, and electrolocation and things like that. And fishes that, um, are pretty mind blowing too. Do you have any plan to pursue that in the future in, in your career? Um, wh which one, the uh, electric work or? Anything beyond sound or animal perception more <laughs> like different ways? Um, not, not I, I don't know exactly what will happen, but I, I do think it, as far as outreach, um, goes, it, it could be really a really cool way to connect. And, and even in this talk, right, I didn't use any sounds. And that's usually because I'm worried about codecs or things like that, that are going to mess up the presentation. But I think we could use sounds in a lot more artistic ways to sort of bring in a, a bigger, a bigger audience to this, this kind of research. So we'll see. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, Michael, Michael asked if airplane noises were ever an issue. Um, no, I would say not for two reasons. One is, is this wasn't really in an area that had a lot of airplanes flying over, but also the way that we are calculating sound pressure levels are integrated across the entire day. So, so short term duration, little spike events like that don't influence the, the overall measure at all in the end. Well, I'll ask a bird question, Dylan. Uh, your outliers, so the species that uh, tended to hang in there and not leave um, in your noise, were there any species that stuck out to you as interesting? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I mean, I, so because we we're thinking about this in terms of like, you know, which ones are riparian specialists maybe, and, and, you know, which ones have perhaps evolved to deal with this sorts of noise. And so um, yellow warblers are one of the ones that weren't affected at all. And they are, you know, pretty intimately tied with um, riparian habitat, but um, song sparrows were affected and they're, they're also sort of intimately tied. So it's, I mean, it's kind of uh, anecdotal, but I thought that was interesting. And I was starting to wonder a bit about, well, sparrows as a group are pretty, pretty diverse. And I, I tend to, and I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts, Heidi, but I tend to think of warblers as being more music or, you know, more closely tied to streams than, than sparrows as a, as a group in, in whole. Um, but also things like, you know, meadowlarks weren't affected, which wasn't really a surprise because they're, they have super loud calls that you can hear as you're driving by with the windows rolled up. And um, so, yeah, there's a lot to explore still, I would say. Well, 
one quick thought and be, probably because I studied foraging vigilance, but song sparrows often forage in really dense closed in habitats versus yellow warblers are more like out on the edges of branches and stuff. But I don't know, something to look into. That's cool though. Yeah. Thanks, Heidi. Hey, Dylan, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna ask a question. I know I'm gonna talk with you later, but I feel like this question has local appeal. So uh, Idaho Representative um, Simpson has a plan to remove four dams on the Snake River, and he calls you up and says, Dylan, based on your science, what would you expect is going to happen when I remove these four dams? Thank you, Simpson. <laughs> Well, I would say, I would say, I, I would actually start from the salmon perspective and just say we need we need our salmon up in these streams and we need to remove the dams for that reason. You know, the hell with the noise. But from the noise perspective, uh, you know, returning these these soundscapes or these acoustic environments to their their natural state, I do think is important, especially as we're continuing to expand urbanization and building more roads and things like that. There are fewer and fewer places where animals that are intimately tied to these acoustic environments just don't have those natural environments anymore. Um, and so I would say from that perspective that it, it would be great, great to remove them. So do you, do you think you could make predictions for what's going to happen to these ecosystems then based on the data that you have? No, um, because I, I wouldn't say that I, uh, I did an incredibly good job at validating any of these models to be able to make predictions, um, just simply because we were more hypothesis testing. But I guess we could look at that and, and see how well like out of, out of sample we're able to predict with them. Um, but I would be hesitant to do that at this stage. <laughs> Hey Dylan, uh, this is Jake, um, and uh, I'm, great talk. I was wondering if um, if you think that the timing of uh, of the noise throughout the day could um, could make a big difference because you integrated the sound over over the course of the day to get the sound pressure level for each site. Um, and do you think that something like bursts of noise uh, sporadically um, could be um, could have a different effect from like kind of a a constant uh, but lower background level? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, I think that, well, I, I think, you know, one answer is that a lot of the bursts, if, if they're short enough and there aren't enough of them, won't affect the overall measure that much. But I do agree that likely all these temporal components, right, are, are really important. And especially, you know, Heidi was just talking about uh, foraging vigilance trade-offs and having sort of a startle, startling noise is going to be very different than sort of a consistent noise. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of um, room for future work to sort of parse apart continuous or, um, you know, long-term noises versus short-term bursts and, and really tease apart all these different quantifiable pieces. We just haven't really started doing that. And a lot of work a lot of work um, doesn't really quantify the soundscape very well at all. And so we, we really went above and beyond to quantify both sound level and, and frequency, even though it is, it is still kind of crude, right? It, it's like we, took, we got one metric of each um, for each day at each location, but it's also sort of unprecedented. So I'm, I'm hoping that people continue to sort of pull these things apart and try to understand the actual mechanisms of, of what is driving changes in communities and animal behavior and stuff like that. Okay. Th thanks, Jake. Time for one more question and Leonora has her hand up. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, this is a super cool study and I love that you're able to look across so many different taxonomic groups. I think that's really wonderful to get a bigger picture. And I'm wondering, um, maybe I missed this, but can you use your your bird and bat abundances as factors in your model when you're looking at insect abundances? Yeah, yeah, that I, that's what I really would like to do next. And, and I haven't done that. We did use 
um, like bird abundance in the caterpillar foraging model, just to try to control for that. And we and we did the same with uh, bat activity in, in some of those foraging tests. But yeah, that would be next. And I'm just trying to think about how, how exactly to tackle that, if it's some sort of model selection approach or something like that. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's in the future. Yeah, I look forward to seeing that. I think that'll be really cool. Great, thanks, Leonora. All right, everyone, let's give Dylan another round of applause. Great job. Sorry for going a little long, everyone. So the committee's gonna stick around for the closed door and, and everyone else have a lovely day.